So good afternoon, everyone, to what is the panel five called the Agency of Art of our European Planetary Wellbeing Winter School. It's a pleasure having you here. Uh, my name is Leila Melon, and I'm the Executive Director of the Planetary Wellbeing Institutional Framework at the Pompeo Fabra University. Um, it's a pleasure welcoming you here, and today we're going to take a bit of a different look to the what is the emergency, or better said, climate emergency, in the framework of planetary well-being and what we're trying to achieve. So there is something that we already did during this week uh, with our students of the Winter School, uh, that is discuss how we have underlying morals and values that we actually need to change in order to, climb, to combat, basically, what is the climate emergency and what are the great challenges of our day. Um, art is definitely part of those morals and values and of communication that goes beyond academic articles and scientific findings is something that touches us as human beings and finds this way um, where the science sometimes doesn't and the numbers. So I'm very happy to be with you here today. Um, I want to thank the Magba Museum for making this possible, but specifically Professor Valverde, mm -hmm. who put all of this together and is so kindly hosting us today. So welcome with us, and I hope you're going to enjoy the session. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, uh, Lila. Uh, I think the whole school would not be possible without you. It's not with, <laughs> for me or with me, but without you, it wouldn't have been possible at all. So thanks for your fabulous work in the last months in difficult conditions, as you all know. Um, thank you, uh, you all, for being here. Those attending in person here at the uh, Auditorium Meyer uh, in the uh, Museum of Contemporary Art in Barcelona, and those attending uh, online at your, uh, wh wherever you are, at home, in your universities, etc. It is uh, it's a pleasure to have the opportunity of uh, um, collaborating with uh, the uh, museum. It is part of the idea of our university to collaborate with public institutions beyond academia. And this is uh, the first one um, that will take place in, the, uh, in this uh, winter school, and I hope in the winter schools to come. So don't be afraid for much work that, that can be uh, ahead of you, Leila. Um, first of all, uh, as a, uh, in fact, as a representative of the uh, executive committee of the Europeum, and also as a uh, professor of art history at the School of Humanities at the Universitat Pompeu Fabra, I want to thank um, the director of uh, uh, the MAGBA, uh, um, Elvira Diangani Ose, for her uh, immediate willingness to, con to collaborate with us for the generosity of the institution and, uh, and really in the hope that this, this is one first step in a, uh, a broader um, collaboration in the months and years uh, ahead. Um, I also want to thank um, Claudia Segura, also for her enthusiasm, and Yolanda uh, Nicolas, and all of those who make possible, also the technicians who make possible this connection and also this session here. As uh, Leila told you, this, uh, the, the, the title we gave to this, um, this uh, session is the agency uh, of art. What art has to say in the uh, challenges facing we are facing uh, today um, uh, on the issues of uh, uh, climate change, but not only climate change, but also uh, climate justice. Uh, I think that artists, art historians, curators, museum people, um, theoreticians, philosophers have a lot to say, have a lot to help um, uh, to all of us as society and societies in finding new, uh, new um, roads or new orientations in our practices and in our ethics. Uh, and in our politics, obviously, uh, as well. So this afternoon uh, will uh, be or will go as following. Uh, 
I will um, end very soon this um, small talk, uh, literal and figurate. And um, I will give the floor to Claudia Segura, who will be presenting besides uh, uh, a bit uh, where we are, what is this museum, uh, but she will be presenting a, um, a film that will be uh, uh, that will be projected, a film by artist Max de Esteban, which is called A Forest. Um, I think you might have looked in the uh, in the uh, internet, in the web, and you might have had a uh, uh, you might have uh, read a bit about. Uh, the artist and the film, but in any case, Claudia will be presenting that. The film uh, is 24 minutes, 23, 24 minutes long, but it's absolutely fascinating and captivating. So I'm sure that uh, uh, you won't be uh, at all looking at the clock. And, uh, and will be really impressed by this uh, work. Then we will have a, a lecture by um, uh, Santiago Zavala, uh, professor also at the Universitat Pompeu Fabra, an ICREA research uh, professor of philosophy. And then uh, we will be having TJ, Professor TJ Demos that will be connecting from California online um, later on. You know that the, 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 the time difference makes uh, for us a bit difficult. And this is why we had to begin later to have uh, uh, Professor Demos at 8 in the morning in Santa Cruz um, uh, talking for uh, for us um then we will have a uh, um some half an hour or so or as much as you like um for questions and uh, and answers so um now i leave the floor to claudia segura which i am i cannot resist but saying that it is a pleasure to have an alumni of upf um, pre collaborating with me. She was not only one of my best students ever, clever uh, and sensitive and intelligent, and um, she's uh, here as curator of uh, uh, collections and exhibitions of uh, uh, the Museum for Contemporary Art in Barcelona after a very successful career in other countries, but back to Barcelona, back home. Thanks uh, God and uh, for the luck of all of us who can uh, share with her as many initiatives as possible in the future. Thank you, Claudia. You, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much, Isabel, for these amazing and kind words. They are reciprocally. I mean, I feel exactly the same. And I'm very, really very happy to, to be able to host the MAGBA, be able to host this uh, fantastic um, symposium and these fantastic lectures that we're going to have an intervention, so please. And the museum is open for all of you. Whenever you come to Barcelona and the students that you're here, you know that this is your place as well. Well, MAGBA is a contemporary art museum that is committed to present practices and projects that deal with our contemporaneity and serves as a platform and space of exchange to offer tools to rethink our present, fabulate about our past, and mainly reimagining possible futures. That's why the MAGBAS collection, which is an important collection, acquires works and projects that serve specifically, specifically to this mission. A Forest, a 23-minute film created by the artist Max Esteban and acquired actually recently, last year, is a clear example for this. The work reflects upon the implications of artificial intelligence technology and the ideological frameworks under which it operates. Its focus is not the technology itself, nor its aesthetics imaginary. Instead, 
It is the exploration of the social values at stake due to the potential dominance of this digital infrastructure and the ideology behind its leading investors. The dystopian imaginary portrait that you will see in a few minutes, um, which looks like a forest, and it's actually produced by the same artificial intelligence when asked to create an image of itself, announces a future in which it won't only be impossible to attribute a monopoly on individuality to humans, but that implies the abolition of the idea of democracy through the predictive powers of algorithm. If we think about planetary well-being, notions such as democracy and freedom need to be added into the puzzle. Eduardo Kong, anthropologist, asks the question, can forests think? This is a question that I invite you to resolve um, after the screening and that we can talk about in the Q&A. WJT Mitchell writes a beautiful text about this piece that we're going to screen right now. He says, I'm going to quote the following passage. Approximately 300 species vanish every day, one every five minutes. Given its notorious adaptability, the human species can probably survive the rising seas, expanding deserts, and poison air and water inside arc-like pots for the very rich. Max de Esteban contemplates this future without flinching, challenging us to think of something better. Maybe we can do the screening now, and after that, we'll have the talk of Santiago. Thank you very much. Um, a lot of questions, a bit, I mean, if uncanniness has a uh, representation, that would be it. This is scary, I'm sure. I don't know for you, who are much younger than I, but it is scary for me. Um, I wouldn't like someone knowing my desires before I do it myself. That's a bit embarrassing. That would be a bit embarrassing. Um, but I'm sure that there are a lot of questions that this uh, work of art uh, brings uh, to uh, all of us and that uh, you will be able to think about it and, uh, and, and ask questions in the, when the, common, the, the moment comes of... Um, Q and A. By now, I want to. We, we uh, will be uh, hearing, uh, listening to uh, Santiago Zavala, um, my colleague and my friend, um, who's a colleague at the uh, Department of Humanities at the Universitat Pompeu Fabra. He's a, um, as I said before, a research professor, an ICREA research professor of philosophy. He's the author of uh, many uh, books, um, successful and uh, um, very much uh, reviewed and talked about. I will uh, mention a few of them, Why Only Art Can Save Us, Aesthetics and the Absence of Emergency, and the uh, most more recent one, Being at Large, Freedom in the Age of Alternative Facts, and uh, Santiago is uh, at this moment ending the writing of a uh, of his uh, latest book, who will be appearing uh, next year. Um, with uh, Santiago, we have been working on this initiative of planetary well-being in the last uh, this last year. We organized together a um, we organized a um, a symposium. Uh, late November or late October, I don't remember anymore. I think it was late October, um, under the title of uh, uh, Climate Emergency uh, Through uh, Art and Aesthetics, where we shared uh, a um, discussion and debates with two artists and uh, two uh, philosophers, one of them being uh, uh, Santiago uh, himself. So we have been trying to make this bridge uh, with this initiative of planetary well-being itself, 
which is uh, 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 with uh, the uh, social scientists and life scientists that are in this moment working in the other sessions, as you uh, have been seeing, uh, you students of, um, of uh, the winter school, and now uh, with the uh, Department of Humanities. So we, Santiago and I, are very keen on wanted, wanting to make the arts, literature, films, uh, poetry, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, find a place and an important and fundamental place in um, in this initiative of the um, of planetary well-being and we are working with uh, our colleagues Leila and others um, in this uh, in this uh, direction so uh, now um, uh, we will uh, uh, Santiago will be uh, talking about trying to either answer or making us think even a bit more on the question why and how can art rescue us into the greatest emergencies. So thank you, uh, uh, Santiago, and the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Isabel. Thank you very much for everyone who came here today and all everyone online as well. Um, yeah, as Isabel mentioned, we already we organized a conference in in October, which the title was Understanding Climate Change Through Art and Aesthetics. And the main goal of that conference, which you can actually see online on, on YouTube, was to point out that, well, we do not understand climate change at all. Uh, we live today in what I will now explain is an, an age where the greatest emergency is the absence of emergency. And, um, and Basically, what we just saw now is a very good example of that, I think. Uh, but basically, the idea of the conference was to point out that facts are not, are not, are not, are not enough. In other words, uh, scientists might tell us all the facts we want, uh, and we actually have all the facts we, uh, we really need to, to know, to change, to make any change. But facts alone are not enough. Uh, this is a very important point of departure. If anyone, I'm sure there are a lot of scientists uh, listening to us now, uh, and they, they would probably agree with me because most scientists are very tired of giving us all the facts because there is no change, nothing, nothing really happens afterwards. So the idea that uh, science is not enough, or, or even better, as um, Martin Heidegger, the most important philosopher since Hegel, explained, science does not think, it calculates, right? Like in, intelligent, intelligent, intelligent um, artificial intelligence. Well, in this condition, that means that we find ourselves in a, in a situation where we have to ask different questions. Uh, different questions, not necessarily new questions, but different questions. So the title of my presentation today, which um, why and how art can rescue us into the greatest emergency, has to do with this distinction I think we have to do between an emergency and an absence of emergency, or an emergency and the greatest emergency we have. I believe that we now find ourselves uh, in an age where uh, Agamben's theory of state of exception is not enough to understand anymore our spiritual predicament. In other words, now we don't live anymore in, a, in an age where we need the state of exception perhaps to change the laws or even to, to make the laws the way we want them. We don't necessarily even need emergencies anymore. Now we actually manage to construct um, a condition, a political, social, political, I would say a, in general condition, where the greatest emergency are the emergencies that do not emerge, okay? So, for example, now we have, beside the war that is starting right now in, uh, in North of Europe, beside that, for example, if we look at the pandemic, the pandemic is an emergency now, okay? But for the past 15 years, or let's say seven, uh, for 13 years, it has been an absence of emergency because we were constantly warned that we were going to have uh, a pandemic like the one we had. So it's, there's, some, there's a problem there that we have with how to understand or whether we are even capable of interpreting something that another way, another way of explaining a greatest emergency is simply by meant, uh, referring to them as warnings. How come we do not listen anymore to warnings? Okay? So the problem I think that in order to understand today the greatest problem we have is the idea of making this distinction and to recognize that the greatest emergencies we have today are the ones we do not confront. So 
even right now, if we read carefully what's going on in um, in in the Ukraine, that probably also is a very good example of uh, of a situation that was not taken into. There was not enough policy there. There was not enough diplomacy there for the past years. So it was something that was left in some way, an absence of emergency that was left uh, on its own. Now, the question I, I'm sure some of you are thinking now is, well, why am I, um, um, why don't we listen to warnings? Right? Uh, because uh, when I say we don't listen to warnings, I'm referring to philosophers, I'm referring to scientists, I'm referring to basically to everyone. It's not a question of, and most of all, I'm referring to society at large. Right? So how come we do not listen to warning? Because there's a very big difference between, between understanding, between listening, between interpreting. They're two very different things. So I, my philosophical upbringing has to do with hermeneutics, with the philosophy of interpretation. So for us, hermeneutic philosophers, it is very important to try to interpret everything we really cannot see. In other words, Freud, of course, is one of the great hermeneutic philosophers. He has a small book called The Interpretation of Dreams. Or we have Thomas Kuhn, who explained how science is not a, 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 linear, a linear engagement towards truth. So we have a huge amount of examples of hermeneutic philosophers that try to point out that, well, we have to also learn to interpret what we cannot see, what we, even worse, what we don't think that it's valuable. Okay? Something that, of course, in, uh, intelligent, artificial intelligence is not able to do. So the point here is to, to say, well, how come we're not listening to warnings? And, and a lot of people have been talking now that we now live in an age of so-called alternative facts, right? Or even worse, that we now have to deal with post-truths. Um, like if 50 years ago, there weren't any alternative facts and there weren't any uh, post-truths. So th those are not new notions at all. There's nothing new happening there. But what did happen there, that now we feel, we, we feel strong, we feel we can feel this problem of alternative facts in, in a more clear way than we used to, most of all because we find ourselves in this condition that I refer to as uh, the absence of emergency. What does this mean? This means that uh, if we look at this century, this brand new century we have now, we have three big events. So we have 9-11, we have the 2008-2009 financial crisis, and now we have this pandemic. I think, and there are a number of other philosophers uh, who, who more or less who agree with me, or I agree with them, goes both ways, um, that nothing really changed. Absolutely nothing changed. On the contrary, uh, nothing changed after September 11. What changed? An intensification of the measures of military control that was already in, in action before. That's what changed. What changed after 2008, 2009 financial crisis? Banks were dissolved? No, they were saved. So neoliberal capitalism was intensified even more, okay? And now what has, what's happening after this pandemic? Are we really preparing for the next pandemic? I don't think we are, right? And, and the measures of control and, and intensification of measures of control and of, um, and not only of control, but also of, um, of many other things has intensified. Has intensified to the situation where we find ourselves now and this is the, my best example, so listen carefully, that even when they tell us the truth, for example, WikiLeaks or Edward Snowden, and all this, uh, every, even when we actually have the clear documents, even there, nothing changes. Because if you really think carefully, if we look at, uh, I don't know, Snowden's document, well, Obama should have resigned in 24 hours, basically. I mean, it's very clear. He should have resigned, and he did not resign. He didn't have to resign. And even worse, now we actually have politicians, okay? I'm just thinking now of uh, Donald Trump, but there are so many others in, uh, in office right now that do not need even to declare emergencies. Because now, if in 2003 George Bush could use the state of exception to declare an emergency in Iraq, today Trump, and we see not only Trump, but also Bolsonaro, they don't need to do even to declare an emergency. And emergencies have not been declared. Okay, in the United States, during the pandemic, there has not been declared a state of exception like in Europe, for example. Okay? And even worse, climate change has not even been taken as an emergency, right? or, or the refugee crisis, for example. Okay? So we are in a condition now, I think, that where it's a very good, I think it's, a, it's appropriate to talk about an emergency, a condition where um, there aren't any emergencies, or at least the emergency, the, the, emerg the really important emergencies we have, they're not confronted as they should be. Owen Jones, a very interesting and very smart journalist, 
right after, as soon as the pandemic began, he wrote an article pointing out how, well, it is important that we face the pandemic, that we confront the problem we have. And at the same time that we remember that about seven or eight million people die every year of lung cancer in Europe because of uh, our pollution, the air pollution. So one wonders, I guess air pollution is an absence of emergency now because we're not tackling it at all, okay? Uh, now, uh, let's say that we are now that we agree, or that let's imagine that a few of you more or less agree with me that there is a problem of emergencies emerging, okay? Emerging out, finally, okay? Let's agree that some of you agree with some of these ideas, which of course you can find much better explained, I think, in some of my books, but... Um, so why why should we uh, why should we come here to the Museum of Modern Contemporary Art? Why should we talk from art about these issues? Why should we talk from philosophy about these issues? Well, we're certainly not going to continue asking science for help because if we are in this condition, it's certainly not because of art and philosophy. That for sure, I I, I think we all agree in that. So it is it's. It has to be, they have, they have done their work, it's worked like a charm, but you know, having the vaccine does not mean that everybody is going to use it, right? There are a lot of people who still have a lot of uh, skepticism towards it. So the idea here is to try to understand that what has caused the situation here of the sort of, um, why don't we listen to warnings anymore? And one of the reasons we don't listen to warnings is because we have in some way left aside or become convinced that we don't need any more filters. In other words, that we don't need any more the New York Times, we don't need any more uh, even scientists, we don't need any more philosophers, we don't need anyone to interpret some uh, findings that we have so that we can directly acknowledge in some way transparent. We can find knowledge right away, right? I can find out whether the vaccine works or not on my own, even if I studied Heidegger for 20 years. No, I probably shouldn't even start doing that, right? And uh, I assure you Heidegger wouldn't either. The problem is that a lot of people who didn't even study Heidegger are sure that they, they think they can find this information online, right? So there's a transparency there, okay, that now there's a, basically a lack of authority, okay, which in some way has uh, given rise to the situation here that some philosophers call uh, transparent, like Gianni Vattimo, or even... Um, or there are many other ways to, to describe this. So why, why do we have to start from art? Why do we have to respond through art? Why do we have to respond? Why do we have to look at artists to see what artists are doing today? Well, first of all, I agree that we have the solutions. In other words, there are many solutions we already have. Scientists are already explaining to us a number of facts that we can, um, that we can you know, they're, they're very good starting point, but that's not enough. Uh, we're not moved by them. Okay? And in order to, to be properly moved, well, it's not a question of message, but it's most of all a question of intensity. In other words, there is an intensity which is always missing okay, in science or in the way science is, is given to us or in the way or whether we are capable of understanding science. I mean, this should not be a question of that we all become scientists in order to uh, uh, understand science. That's not the only issue because science has a lot, a lot of problems too, right? It's a, it's a big, uh, I mean, you should, we should wonder why the vaccines are not, uh, the patent is not free. It's a quite an important question here. It's, it's not only a, te a technical question, it's most of all a political question. So uh, the idea here is that art, unlike science, and maybe perhaps even unlike philosophy, okay, um, always involves a critical element which is meant to steer, okay, to disturb, to shake our existence, okay, our everyday existence. There is an element there that it's meant to, to bother us, right, to, to make sure that we do not feel always comfortable, always at home, okay, that we do not need an artificial intelligence to tell us what we, what we want. So now all this does not mean that scientists and philosophers are not free to do what they want. Of course they are, they are, they are as free as, uh, as anyone else. But rather that their work are more framed, okay, much more framed by economic and political systems than the one of the artists. Okay, so the artists tend to have, and I have a lot of art, French artists, they, they're not very happy when I say this because they have to, they don't have a salary, so it's, it's not such a good deal. But still, they do have a freedom that most of us, most of those working in the sciences, or maybe even in philosophy, um, don't have. So they are, in some way, they are allowed to get in much more trouble or they're allowed to, there's a freedom there that we don't have in some other, in some other, in some other of these other 
in philosophy or in science or anything. So um, the reason we should look into art also is because of, not only because of the freedom I think they have, but because that they are, they manage to, their work includes or implies an intensity that scientists do not have, okay? Now, this is, um, this is important to point out because I think that now for the past years, there's, there are a number of artists that I've explained, I show them in, my, um, in some of my books. I'm going to just show three examples today that I think that they are good examples of, uh, of, uh, of works of art, but I, I do not interpret them as work of art. I interpret them as, as, uh, as events, as, as, ways of, as ways of emergencies to emerge in some way. I think there are a lot of artists who manage in some way to disclose these absent emergencies. In other words, these great emergencies we're not taking seriously. We're not confronting as we should. Okay, so um, so the idea here is to point out that these artists, in some way, they are not they're not pushing us into these greatest emergencies, but rather they are rescuing us from emergencies. Because normally we we use the idea of rescuing. You know, you are you have to be rescued from an emergency, right? You have a problem, you have to be rescued from an emergency. No, 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 the idea is to be rescued into an emergency, in, and most of all, into one of those greatest emergencies we have. Because, for example, today, the greatest emergencies we have is probably a very big blackout from in, in the internet. That might probably be, if we have a serious block blackout for, let's say, a week, it would have much worse consequences than the one that the pandemic had, much worse, okay? So maybe there are a number of emergencies that we should take into consideration, and we don't. And I think that there are, there are a, lot, a lot of artists today that manage to disclose this, um, this emergency. Um, so in order to explain how we can rescue us into three emergencies that I pointed out, that I will point out now, I've chosen three works of art that rescue us into a technological, a pharmaceutical, and an environmental great emergencies. What often emerges in in great art, as well as in other realms of human practices, is not the representation of beauty. In other words, art today doesn't have anything to do with, with that. It is, it is, it is much more than that. Okay? It's not, not that there's anything wrong with that, but it's much more than that. But it has much more to do with the disclosure of an event okay, that is invisible. In, in other words, what I mentioned at the beginning, the fact that we are incapable of, of reading what is not there when we're supposed to. Okay? Uh, that is invisible to our aesthetic senses, intellectual skills, and most of all, cultural interest. Okay? And all this has to do with, I think also, something else I, I, I will add before showing the images, is that another way of explaining the absence of emergency is this idea of explaining that now, also in philosophy, unfortunately, there are a lot of thinkers who are uh, returning to what after the First World War used to be called le retour à l'ordre. In other words, a return to order, which, um, which basically it's something, it's this idea that we have to, over, in some way, overcome postmodernity, overcome the end of meta narratives, overcome all this, all these people that criticizes colonialism, colonialism, and rather we have to return to some sort of form of universality and to fight the fake news and all this. In philosophy, they call this new realist philosophy or uh, OOO, speculative ontology, or whatever they call it now. And this is one of the most degrading things you can happen in contemporary philosophy now because it is, um, first of all, the problem, every time someone calls a new philosophy, they are lying. Nothing new ever happened in philosophy. Uh, I don't know how can someone can imagine that something new happens. It's, but anyway, uh, apparently the problem of realism was discovered this century. It goes back quite, quite far. And, uh, and the idea of, of requesting, as many philosophers, Quentin Milasou, uh, Graham Harman, and some others, some of them even are my friends still, uh, they're still my friends. Uh, the problem with this is that this is, this is a, a way of returning to order. It's a way of, of, uh, of enacting this absence of emergency. In other words, uh, those who in some way pretend that we have to return to facts, okay, in a, in a situation where facts are not even enough, it's a way also of requesting that we remain happy, we remain content, we remain satisfied with the world the way it is. In other words, this is an updated translation of Margaret Thatcher's famous, there is no alternative. Of course, there's always an alternative, and uh, if there isn't any other alternative, then this theory of the absence of emergency is particularly correct. So I, I guess I am a friend of Thatcher in some way. Well, at least I, I try to understand what she said. So 
let's now the idea is I want to show you these three works of art that uh, that rescue us, I think, into absence of emergencies. So if you can show the first slide, ah, here we go, which works very nicely with the video we just saw. This is a work by um, Filippo Minelli, who is an Italian artist who um, who basically he rescues us, according to me, but he seems to agree, uh, into the technological paradox of our age, the apparent neutrality claimed by social media and microblogging services such as Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, et cetera. Minelli places the word Twitter on the wall of a factory farm full of identical turkeys. These turkeys are identical not simply because they are forced to reproduce and grow in identical patterns, but also because they are framed by an environment that pretends to be neutral, a simple growth medium which actually relies upon the elimination of individual freedom differences in services of, to industrial process. Minelli installation is meant to relate these turkeys to social media users, in other words us, okay, uh, who are automatically framed within a global infrastructure okay, where alterations are almost impossible. Okay. Uh, this work is called, it's a series of works, this one is called Contradiction. It reveals social media apparent transparency and neutrality. In other words, absence of emergency. Okay. So this is Filippo Minelli's work, which I think is a very good example about also in, relate to, in relation to the video we saw of, um, of um, artificial intelligence. Then we have here a work by Beverly Fishman. Uh, which basically uh, she tries to, I guess, to rescue us into our addiction to drugs, which is also another absent emergency and a very important one. I wonder which one of us, because I did take something this morning, did not take a pill this morning. So uh, Fishman sculptures of pills and tablet work as a warning because it discloses the hidden, hidden pharmaceutical aggressive branding and, and marketing tactics. Okay, the exaggerating supersizing of pills based on the sign of actual drugs point to the excesses she sees in pharmaceutical business. The problem at the title of her works indicates, which the title, by the way, is In Sickness and Health, is how this design promotes medication to the sick and to the healthy alike. In other words, Fishman uses this, this colors uh, to elaborate the patterns that warn us of the complicated relationship of a 500 billion year industry. In other words, I think for every dollar they use, I think it's 17, that for every dollar they use to produce the actual uh, drug, it's like about $17 are used just for the branding. Uh, this is another very serious problem, of course, that we do not confront at all, okay? Uh, and that probably should be confronted in some very important way. And I guess Fishman's works, sculptures are very, um, at least, I think they are, they, what is nice to see them, if you, if you ever get a chance to see one of her shows, is that when you look at these sculptures, you actually see yourself on them, you know, they reflect yourself, and you can see a distortion there, a distortion which is actually what the drug is probably giving you at that time, okay? Um, the third, uh, the third um, slide I'm, sure I'm going to show you here, it's called Lines, and it's a work by um, Pekka Nintivirta and Timo Ajo, which are two uh, artists from Northern Europe, I think from Finland, if I remember correctly. And they, I think this is a very good example of, uh, of our inability to listen to warning, because as you can imagine, um, this, uh, these beams of light, they represent Okay, they represent the um, a scientific estimate of the level that the sea will rise if the if the if the climate continues to warm. Okay, I think it's 2050. I think that's the estimate, and they have a number of works like this, and where they show through these beams of light uh, precisely where where <laughs> where we will be at basically if we continue to ignore right uh, to to ignore the um, the uh, the warnings of science in general, okay? So we have the facts, we have truths, we have everything we need, right? But we do not do anything. 
Uh, and it's not necessarily because we are incapable of doing anything, but it more, has more to do because we're not touched enough by it. We're not necessarily uh, conditioned by it enough. So my idea or my thesis, at least my, in my work, is that after art often works better than scientific announcements, okay? even better than philosophical treaties, as a way to reveal emergencies. Okay? This is not because the artists have a great ability to create beauty, but rather for the intensity and depth of their work. Okay? Intensity and depth of the work. So documentary photograph of the rising sea levels, for example, can be truthful, but are rarely as powerful as the works of art that address these emergencies. Okay, so if you actually go now, I think you can read this in Naomi Klein's, one of Naomi Klein's most recent books. She explains how in big geological uh, conferences, scientists have stopped, almost stopped uh, pointing out, find, um, pointing out the, the discoveries and they just talk about how politics should work and how they, they can move the, um, the public. Because at this point, we have the facts. The problem is not anymore of, uh, of, of findings, but rather of, uh, of interpreting, basically, of accepting the fact that we, we can interpret. Okay? So in order to, to sort of sum up here, because my time is, is about to finish, I'm going to quote um, Hans Gerd Gadamer, who is a very important German philosopher, who died in 2002, but was born in 1900. So he was, he was born 102. He died at 102. And he has a number of, um, of books, uh, very important books, in particular Truth and Method, where he explains how, it is, how important it is to stop uh, imagining that truth has something to do or that in order to achieve truth, we need specific methods. His idea is that we do not need, and actually we shouldn't even be be limiting truth to methods. On the contrary, uh, method is something that takes place perhaps within certain truths and not necessarily through method. So uh, for Gadamer, what is important in a work of art, and the only reason we should really be looking into, into works of art or try to understand our reality through works of art is because when a work of art, and I quote him, when a work of art truly takes hold of us, it is not an object that stands opposite to us, which we look in the hope of, um, of seeing through it and intending something, a meaning or, or, or understanding something of it, it is actually quite the reverse. The, art of, the artwork is an eragonis, it's an event, an event that appropriates us into itself, it shocks us, it overturns us, and sets up a world of its own in which we are drawn. In other words, a work of art is one that in some way will make sure that we become involved in the event that it's trying to disclose. That is what a true work of art should be. Now, um, scientists and philosophers can also overturn our world. I assure you I tried. But, but their work preserves a distance that is constitutive okay, of their findings and renders their effects less immediate. A work of art seeks to reduce this distance Okay. not only to draw our attention, but also to involve us in an experience the artist considers significant. So the issue here is not anymore, of course, of contemplation, obviously, but it's a question of intervention. If we now look throughout, uh, at least in Europe, but not only, actually, throughout serious contemporary uh, art museums like, like this one, we will see that there are a number of works of art, like the one we saw uh, today, the video, that request an involvement, right? Uh, and there is an involvement request here because uh, if we look at the past um, 50 years, there has been a change, a change of paradigm that it is not anymore, uh, it is not anymore that we request artists something, but it's artists that request us something, okay? There are demands from art to us, okay? So if we haven't been able to listen to Okay, when, when I titled the title, when, I, when I, I added the title of one of my books is Why Only Art Can Save Us, and everybody think that I literally meant that. No, if you read the book carefully, the idea is that, well, uh, if we want to talk about salvation or a complete change of the horizon in which we live, well, we need to change. We need to change from where we, are st from where we start. In other words, we are not, we, we're still thinking too methodically Okay? We're thinking too much, 
still from science, as if science will be the only result, the only way we have to change the world. The problem is that um, philosophers until now, contrary to what Marx said, mm -hmm. have uh, been changing the world too much. The, what is important now is to start to think, to interpret it again, if we want to have some possibility of emancipation. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, um, thank you, Santiago, for your wonderful talk, uh, which will add on some other questions to the uh, already present questions in the uh, previous, um, well, in the film we saw. And I don't know if now, now we are, yes, um, uh, here we are. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Can you hear me all right? Hi. Professor, Hi. Professor Demos, we have corresponded a lot in the last days, but we have never met. Now we meet even if on a screen. So good uh, afternoon from Barcelona. Good morning in California, I guess. Um, we are really honored and happy to have you here. You hear me well, I guess. Good. So we have had now um, part of our session, which was, as you know, the screening of the uh, film by Max Esteban A. Forrest. Professor Santiago Zavala just ended his talk on uh, the emergency uh, emergencies and um, and art, etc. And you will be giving the third and last uh, talk of the session before we go on uh, to the Q and A um, of the public uh, that are here um, physically in 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 the auditorium of the Museum of Mod of uh, Contemporary Art and those who are at home or online or at the universities online. So just let me briefly present you, introduce you, Professor T.J. Demos um, needs hardly a, uh, an introduction for uh, art historians, uh, art theorists, but let me tell you in any case that his professor at the Department of the History of Art and Visual Culture at the University of California at Santa Cruz. He's also found, uh, founding director of its member for creative ecologies. His publications are specifically fitting for the um, uh, uh, theme of the, of the central theme of this uh, winter school, which is this planetary well-being initiative um, produced and, and, and conceived by the Universitat Pompeu Fabra. And uh, most uh, of his books, or I don't know if most, but some of his books have been translated into Spanish. Uh, for example, Decolonizing Nature, Contemporary Art and Political Ecology. It's uh, Descolonizando la Naturaleza at ACAL, um, translated into Spanish. His last book is, uh, his last published book is the Beyond the World's End, Arts of Living at the Crossing of uh, 2020. And he has uh, also, he has, all, of course, an enormous uh, production, but let me simply also add that he has edited, co-edited, the Raudelch Companion to co on Contemporary Art, Visual Culture and Climate uh, Change that appeared last year, 2021. Um, it is, I could go on and on and on, but it's not me whom you want to hear, but Professor Demos. So um, thanks so much for being with us. And uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Isabel, and um, everyone involved in putting this together. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's great to be here. Wish it was in person. Um, I'm gonna just uh, go ahead. 
and share my screen. I'm hoping you can see that. Uh, I think it's coming through now. Um, <clears throat> so uh, it's it's quite early in California and Santa Cruz where I'm speaking from. I was able to hear um, Santiago's uh, um, presentation, which which I uh, very much enjoyed. I'm going to take um, a complementary approach in what I have to say about climate emergency, um, but it will have some differences. Uh, I, I agree that we're in a, a, a kind of global condition um, where um, perhaps, uh, you know, part of the political situation is that the emergency is not recognized as such. Um, so we're dealing with um, the emergency conditions of an absence of emergency. I think that's very, uh, very generative and productive way of understanding it. I might put the emphasis differently on why that is though, in terms of, um, it's not, I, I see this not so much in that um, polit political discourse or media lacks depth and intensity, uh, whereas art is capable of moving us in ways that we need to, in order to recognize and feel the emergency. I think rather politically, at least from my perspective in the States, um, it's largely because we're, we're in the situation of the absence of emergency because um, <clears throat> because of capital and class conflict, because uh, political, economic, and corporate elites have done so much damage to the political process uh, that many of us see um, a situation of hopelessness in terms of uh, doing anything about the emergency that many of us actually do recognize. Um, and I think that that's a big uh, problem that's international, even global these days. Um, it has to do with a, a kind of post-democratic or emerging um, authoritarian political condition uh, where we we have to confront the uh, affects of impotence, basically, uh, that where where we uh, are aware of mounting emergencies, but we can't do anything about them, where we feel like there's very little uh, we can actually do uh, about them. At least that that rings true in the state's uh, situation. So I'll go ahead with my presentation. I look forward to being able to talk about this more um, with my other uh, panelists um, afterwards. Um, so we're told actually repeatedly that we're in a climate emergency uh, in recent years. Um, but what, and more importantly, whose is it? Uh, if you Google the term climate emergency, you'll, you'll come up with nearly 6 million hits, uh, including one by the United Nations Environmental Program, uh, which defines climate emergency um, by referencing the work of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, which says climate change is real and human activities are the main cause. They go on to state that owing to greenhouse gas emissions, global temperatures have been rising since the industrial revolution, um, causing heat waves, droughts, flooding, winter storms, hurricanes, and wildfires, requiring urgent action to curb emissions in order to limit war warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. And certainly some of those, um, those, those climate events are uh, deeply felt in incredibly intensified ways when your house burns down owing to an uncontrollable wildfire. This is a major problem uh, in the part of California where I'm based, where we, we're dealing with a yearly uh, um, season of wildfires uh, owing to uh, drying climates and global warming. So not, if you, uh, not far below on the Google search, uh, you'll find the climate mobilization. Uh, which is an environmentalist social movement uh, that's that's very large in the states, whose activist work focuses on precisely getting climate emergencies declared by communities, cities, and governments around the world. Uh, they state, "quote We are in a climate emergency. We need a whole mob a whole society mobilization to prevent climate catastrophe. Let's build the movement that can get us there." Uh, and as their map shows, <clears throat> more than 2,000 city and state governments uh, have declared climate emergencies uh, since 2018. Of course, when cities and, um, and municipalities and governments declare climate emergencies, it doesn't necessarily amount to anything. Uh, rather, it's another scene 
of, uh, of political rhetoric without any consequent action. That's part of the, I think, political impotence I was signaling before. But in addition to this, it's worth pausing to consider uh, who is the we. Uh, in fact, climate emergency is a discourse of conflict. Um, and there are major differences in how it's perceived, uh, whom it's understood to affect and implicate, and when it's said to occur. The IPCC, the scientific body convened by the UN, says climate change has been occurring since the Industrial Revolution, giving global society the next decade to act in order to avoid catastrophic impacts. <clears throat> but others, um, and it's crucial who we listen to these days, uh, such as Melanie Yazi of the Red Nation, uh, the activist organization based in Albuquerque, New Mexico in the States, fighting for global decolonization, argues that, quote, indigenous people have been on the front lines of the struggle for climate justice since 1492, referring to the climate change uh, of land grabs, deforestation, extraction, militarism, forced displacement that's been occurring for centuries. So in other words, for indigenous people, we could say that climate emergency has been in existence since 1492. Really, there are multiple environmentalisms today in the plural uh, and equally multiple emergencies. Uh, the British and now global environmentalist organization Extinction Rebellion explains about uh, the current climate crisis. They say, this is an emergency. Uh, life on earth is in crisis. We're running out of time and our governments have failed to act. Extinction Rebellion was formed to fix this. Um, so that's one uh, approach to uh, the definition of climate emergency. Another is, is in, encapsulated in the response of the, um, the group Wretched of the Earth, the grassroots collective representing indigenous, black, brown, and diaspora groups demanding climate justice and acting in solidarity with communities in the UK and in the global South. And uh, they respond to Extinction Rebellion by explaining that our communities have been on fire for a long time. And these flames are fanned by our exclusion and silencing. Without incorporating our experiences, any response to this disaster will fail to change the complex ways in which social, economic, and political systems shape our lives. Offering some an easy pass in life and making others pay the cost in order to envision a future uh, in which we will all be liberated from the root causes of the climate crisis, capitalism, extractivism, racism, sexism, classism, ableism, and other systems of oppression. The climate movement must reflect the complex realities of everyone's uh, lives in their narrative. <clears throat> so with statements like this, uh, Wretched of the Earth, uh, named after the revolutionary book of 1961 by the Martinican Marxist humanist Franz Fanon, of course, challenges climate emergency claims that narrow global risk to a near future threat of atmospheric carbon pollution, and in the process erasing centuries of racial and colonial violence. Instead, they argue that for climate emergency to be meaningful um, to the lives of the many, it must name the complex and diverse causes including the historical systems of oppression that can only be understood as, as intersecting, where climate emergency is not a single issue politics, but a comprehensive inextricable entanglement of environmental breakdown and social injustice. As such, climate emergency is a matter of fighting colonialism, capitalist inequality, extractive violence, racism and sexism and so on so that climate justice must be similarly encompassing and intersectionalist. So climate justice is economic justice, is social justice, is racial justice, is migrant justice, and so on. This formulation is not only conceptually necessary, but strategically imperative. If the we of climate emergency is to reflect the complex realities of everyone's lives, according to Wretched of the Earth, then it must 
address the full extent of climate emergency, including past, present, and future forms. Doing so means overcoming the politics of climate denialism, uh, which is one way that emergency gets denied. That is the denial of human-caused climate change and the climate science that supports that conclusion, a denial aided by the manufacture of disinformation by the fossil fuel industry and their political, uh, economic, and media enablers. But it also means, as uh, Kai Heron and Jody Dean argue in their uh, essay, Revolution or Ruin, overcoming liberal denialism, meaning both the denial of the capitalist causality behind climate breakdown and its class struggle basis, including capitalism's historical roots in the formation of conquest and colonialism, slavery and racism. That means overcoming the denialism that the politics of emergency can and does enforce in limiting our discussions to the emergency of atmospheric carbonization. So in other words, um, in distinction from, from the earlier presentation, I'm, I'm suggesting that emergency is not simply denied, but also can be operationalized within the interests of the political and economic ruling class. Um, that's another way to consider the politics of emergency. Uh, in other words, emergent, climate emergency can't, be, can't uh, be a fight about carbon in the atmosphere. It also has to be one about powers on the ground. What we're dealing with is an emergency of emergencies, and we can only think and act through and across all of them so as to avoid in our emergency politics, leaving systems of interlinking oppression intact. This battle over definitions and the political stakes of climate emergencies is growing concern within global contemporary art and eco-critical visual cultural studies, especially as writers and activists and artists have taken up the challenge of representing climate emergency from a range of perspectives. Uh, indeed, uh, as my co-editors and I argue in uh, this book, The Rutledge Companion to Contemporary Art, Visual Culture, and Climate Change, um, the arts can define a place of experimental interdisciplinary research, speculative imagination, uh, boundary transgressing creativity, and eco-aesthetic politics, all of which helps conceptually address challenging issues of climate emergency, including its conflicts, and insists on the emergency of emergencies framework. I'll quickly mention a few models of contemporary art that lay, <clears throat> that lay claim to this more expansive and comprehensive understanding of emergency. As these examples show, critical and creative aesthetic engagements uh, straddle diverse fields of practice, including intervening in representational systems to help reconceptualize climate justice and climate emergency. They provide juridical political activism, uh, to challenge climate crimes, and they perform radical historical research to reframe the present uh, and practical decolonial filmmaking and speculative futurism, all to invent worlds to come, very different from the extractive present of racial colonial capitalism and its broadly conceived climate emergency. Uh, these practices also increasingly converge with social movements fed up with uh, electoral inertia, owing to the compromised status of our governmental politics, corrupted by corporate interests, leading our elected, <clears throat> elected officials to pledge fidelity to the donor class of wealthy corporate elites instead of to our constituencies. Uh, so to enact a climate justice transition, those who support it must build solidarity in working for an alternative world. And in the arts, the arts, particularly where creative imagination joins with radical politics, can provide images of what that world looks like. The imperative then is to break through superficial understandings of emergency that, that limit our purview to near future impacts and instead comprehend present conflicts in light of long histories of the intertwinement of social and ecological formations. Um, so, for instance, uh, consider the work of Adrian LaHood and his ongoing investigation of climate crimes, as in his 2018 video uh, installation that maps the global circulation of aerosol emissions, drawing on data compiled by NASA. The piece implicates the UN 
climate summits and their abstract negotiation of future warming limits to a matter of 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, which is something we hear uh, so much about in climate science, which in reality, though, according to Lahoud, uh, means that certain areas of, uh, of the world, including Af uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, will be heated to a much greater extent. The recognition of such uneven warming led the Sudanese diplomat Lumumba de Epin to accuse industrial regions of the global north, and by extension, UN climate negotiators, of participating in climate genocide in Africa, a position that informs Lahoud's project. So Lahoud is bringing critical exposure to the falsity of climate science and the IPCC's statistical idealism uh, by pointing out the uneven distribution of carbon. Or take Arthur Jaffa's 2016 video, Love is the Message, the Message is Death, a searing and powerful compilation of dash cam and cell phone recordings of police brutalizing African-Americans um, where climate becomes ex an expansive socio-ecological category of racial oppression as much as a catastrophic environmental condition. Indeed, one of the video's short passages, you see a clip of this on the bottom right, shows a couple of figures struggling through the floodwaters uh, in the wake of Hurricane Katrina that struck Louisiana in 2005 an unnatural disaster precipitated by the convergence of extreme weather, racial inequality, infrastructure breakdown, according to which it's impossible to separate out climate from social emergency. So again, we're dealing here with an emergency of emergencies. A related approach is forensic architecture, which investigates cases of state and corporate violence uh, visited upon colonized, disenfranchised, and militarily oppressed communities worldwide. Recent cases have, in, have included herbicidal warfare in Gaza, in Palestine, 2019, which documents Israel's use of glyphosate, uh, a to toxic chemical um, herbicide, in order to, in the border zones of this colonized area, uh, where chemical weapons basically are consistently deployed against vegetation in acts of settler atmospherics in order to secure Israeli lands. Or take Triple Chaser, uh, 2019, also by Forensic Architecture, presenting a video that exposes the activities of tear gas manufacturer and Safariland CEO, Warren B. Canders, who sits on the board of the trustees of the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York City. Uh, you see him in the, in the picture on the, on, on the far right. Um, as part of a collective action of institutional liberation, that is to remove corporate complicity in war crimes from the funding and administration of cultural institutions, Triple Chaser helped oust candor successfully from the Whitney as the result of concerted social movement opposition to the cultural institution's art washing of military profiteering. In this case, the, the spread of tear gas used to quell social uprising all over the world, as shown in the Triple Chaser video, defines the weaponization of the atmosphere via state and military securitization, another situation of an emergency of emergencies. Um, and <clears throat> finally, consider the Autolith Group's uh, film, Infinity Minus Infinity, an experimental film from 2019 that addresses geology from a distinctly political ecological perspective, <clears throat> wherein the crimes of racial capitalism, including indigenous genocide, transatlantic slavery and colonialism are intimately and materially linked to the violence of climate catastrophe. The film features a range of allegorical figures <clears throat> appearing as if a chorus of future truth tellers commemorating I'm sorry, commentating on the horror of our climate deranged present, appearing as if a, a chorus, uh, um, sorry, who link colonization of the Americas and the death of some 50 million indigenous people by 1610 to the initiation of the Anthropocene's environmental disaster. Drawing on uh, the black feminist poetics of the Brazilian philosopher, Denise Ferreira da Silva, 
as much as Catherine Youssef's political geology, the film offers an audio visual construction that situates anti-black and anti-indigenous extraction at the origins of the modern environmental um, formation and its longstanding climate emergency. Again, a climate emergency that dates back to 1492. So what I'm interested in these projects is how their diverse approaches to aesthetic practice all disarticulate and reconfigure terms like atmosphere, climate, and environment as more than abstract categories of non-human natures or the subjects of natural and climate sciences. Instead, they become insistently socio-ecological, uh, dense entanglements of politics, economics, and technology, as much as biology, chemistry, and geology. This is not simple, a, a simple matter of a political perspective uh, or of an art history of association and metaphor that draws distinct fields of meaning together. Rather, these practices offer various approaches to what my colleague Donna Haraway calls sensible materialism, where past colonial and extractive violence provide ongoing and determining forces within social life today, forces that play a palpable role in defining the present and in ways that cannot be forgotten, repressed or excluded without enacting epistemic violence. As a site where aesthetics and environment cross uh, in the same way that the Anthropocene identifies the irrevocable collision of human and natural histories, Sensible materialism opens the analysis of what I term intersectionalist ecology or ecology as a science of social as much as natural relations or of trans environmentalist concern. For instance, in her book, uh, <clears throat> In the Wake on, the, on Blackness and Being, Christina Sharp considers the racialization of weather uh, as a kind of psycho-effective structure of being, or what she calls anti-Blackness as total climate, suggesting a like-minded phase shift in the conceptualization of climate emergency. She points to the infamous history of the 1781 Zong atrocity, uh, when that British ship's captain opted to throw 130 slaves overboard and subsequently cash in on insurance claims uh, for lost property uh, after running low on drinking water on the open seas owing to navigational errors. In her discussion of that case, Sharp references the science of what, what, what is called residence time. That is the period it takes a substance to enter and leave the ocean, which for the human body, uh, it's blood and sodium is some 260 million years. So the Zong's past, in other words, <clears throat> is still present for black people. Everything is now, it is all now. She explains, quoting Toni Morrison, Sharp's discussion provides a methodological lesson for environmental justice-based analysis and a sensible materialist framing for an emergency of emergencies. It constitutes a materialist forensic approach to environment and atmosphere that helps avoid the specialist and narrow technocratic thinking or client science, climate science thinking that would abandon history in the production of a future-oriented politics of carbon emergency. So the value of these practices in conclusion um, that I've briefly discussed is that they demand a shift in the discourse uh, showing how analysis, activism and artistic practices that focus their energies on generically conceived atmospheric carbon are inadequately narrow at best, repressive of histories of violence at worst. And this is a case where one emergency can override uh, politically um, in all sorts of violent ways, the emergency of others, uh, right? This is the battle of emergencies, for instance, between Extinction Rebellion and Wretched of the Earth. So critical storytelling, uh, as much as forensic analysis and a new geological poetics offers the opportunity for us as scholars, teachers, writers, students, activists, organizers, to collectively transform by sensing and comprehending otherwise becoming other than docile carbon subjects, colonial settlers, predator, uh, 
perpetrators of discriminatory violence and competitive individuals of material wealth, the typical range of positions reinforced in dominant cultures of petrocapitalism. In this regard, intersectionalist ecology demands a corresponding activism of alliance building across identities of difference, starting from a disidentification from oppressive dominant hierarchical formations of white supremacy, liberalism, and anthropocentrism. This argument is not simply based on an ethics of subjective perspective, uh, a leftism of privileged choice. It rather stems from acknowledging the practical necessity, indeed the emergency, or rather the emergency of emergencies of building inclusive and diverse movements capable of challenging the divide and conquer tactics of the elite political class. Uh, and to take back that political process in the name of, of democratic inclusivity um, and challenge uh, dominant conditions of uh, elite, um, again, economic and political convergence and their endless wars and fossil fuel economies, which are otherwise laying waste to the world. Uh, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your for your uh, talk. I'm sure that uh, um, it will have uh, uh, inspired a lot of uh, thoughts and questions uh, from the um, from the audience. We have uh, um, quite a few students uh, here at the Winter School and other members of the public. And uh, we have also uh, a, a chat from those attending online that will be, uh, and, and uh, my colleague uh, Leila Melon will be organizing a bit the questions that come uh, online, isn't it? Uh, so um, you have here, where is, uh, where is Santiago? He's coming. I think we have yeah, okay. just a little bit he of He just is fetching a, um, chair. a chair. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, there has been talk. We, we, um, people, uh, um, the, the film, uh, Santiago, Professor Demos, uh, have been uh, introducing topics that you students of the Winter School have been uh, approaching these days, but from very different perspectives, such as justice, um, uh, democracy, freedom, etc., uh, etc., et I guess. And uh, that uh, most probably will come from uh, a very, uh, from a very different perspective uh, so which I, I wonder how different the how different you find the talks of uh, this uh, afternoon morning in California have been how they uh, have uh, reached you and and if you have any comments to do on the talks of this um, afternoon so who would like to to uh, begin, uh, if you have any comments or uh, whatever, reflections, criticisms, of course. Maybe we can take a first a question or two that were during the talks online oh, nice. so that Great, we can address them. Yep. And then we're going to charge for hours so. here. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. um, just let's start. So um, our student Zoltan. Um, I was discussing about the danger of artists um, not being educated in facts, right? Um, and then I asked him to kind of rephrase a question, and he said that his question would be, how is the communication between art projects and scientific discourse or popular scientific literature, how are those coordinated? Um, as soon as on one side art is hired art, financed through targeted grants, how do they remain separate? 
And on the other hand, how do scientific facts get translated into art correctly so that there is understanding behind them? And I think that might be an open question for all the panelists. So whoever feels like answering first, be my guest. Professor, Professor Demos. Demos? <laughs> uh, sure, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Um, I think I think there there is no um, generally shared methodology for how artistic practice integrates scientific uh, research. Um, really, this is uh, a field of interdisciplinarity that is mm -hmm. gradually emerging, um, and so there there really aren't, as far as I'm aware of any ways or methods or strategies for ensuring somehow that art artists or artistic researchers are taking up science in ways that are are valid. Um, but I, I would question, I would, I would just add a little questioning to the question in terms of um, the, the point about the, the anxiety that artists may not be taking up science um, correctly, as if there is um, some kind of objective, correct standard uh, that that science can be understood through. Um, I think we have to, if anything, I, what I one of the things that I think is most interesting about artists' engagement with science is when it is critical, when it's challenging science itself as a field of uh, political investments, um, where there's no simple, easy, objective. Um, um, criteria, set of criteria to understand science as as uh, uh, simply factual. Um, so I think, you know, there's been lots of research about this, like some of Latour's work uh, approaching a science of facts versus a science of concerns. I think that th this is very helpful, but I, it's, it's worth remembering that science too is driven by debate, by uh, conflicting positions, by um, by argumentation and um, political and subjective investment, and that's important and something that art and artists, critical artists especially, can bring out in more of um, not not so much a one way street from scientific facts fact to artistic mobilization, but rather um, a, a, a a dialogic interaction that is creative and critical at the same time. That that I think proposes um, a number of methodologies that can be very productive and, and generative, uh, especially when artists bring some challenge to, um, to, science, to science that's increasingly, as we know, dominated by uh, corporate, pharmaceutical, uh, military uh, interests and funding streams, um, just as in some ways uh, artistic practice also is, has been to some degree captured by mar market interests which has had a, a kind of uh, um, all sorts of impacts on what um, art can be these days. Can I just challenge for one second, then continue, and, and then I go to the next question? Because here, the beautiful next part of the question comes in, challenging basically your response. If there are mandatory initiatives that aid the flow of information, however interpreted, of course, between academic discourse and then cultural endeavors or projects. This is basically just a continuation of your talk. If there are some tries already, some kind of institutional way or some kind of um, initiatives that are playing with this, how to transform or translate from one field to another for both fields to add to one another, right? That was another question. Yeah, it's it's a good question. I'm I'm not so familiar with um, the way these channels are institutionalized. Um, in my part of the world, uh, really, there's a lack of institutionalization um, and a generalized uh, kind of separation between disciplines. Uh, very rarely do the arts and sciences come together in any institutionalized way. So I can't really speak to that. But I would be interested in hearing more. And of course, um, you know, there's there's all always uh, forms of uh, like institutionalization and conventionalization that happen when stuff gets too uh, determined by these kinds of streams of funding or the protocol that are that's associated with them. So I understand the the um, anxiety about this. It, it does make sense. 
Maybe just uh, to yeah. yeah, just to add. Thank you so much, Demos. Amazing the talk to all of you. <laughs> <laughs> and just to add, maybe from the museum perspective, um, we've encountered nowadays many artists that actually work with scientists on specific research, and they work for a long time. And there's one element which uh, it's similar in both disciplines. And the beauty of it, or the, the idea of critical art, is actually to merge them, which is the notion of speculation. Science is also driven by a speculation, by needing to argue facts that they prove, or needing to argue an hypothesis that has to be proven by facts, but starts with a speculation. So in that sense, there are um, these elements that are similar and that are interesting to try to challenge somehow. And the artistic discourse can add to, to, to this idea of, of trying to pushing the border somehow. So I, I really think that there are a lot of practices nowadays that work together, that work artists with scientists, and projects that merge from a research based on specific uh, themes related to science. Um, maybe uh, Santiago would like to add something. OK, yep. I'm going to try. Um, <laughs> Well, I, um, uh, as a philosopher, I try to see things. Well, I, ha I have to. We don't have much of a choice. But philosophers do not have. A, um, we're not technicians, right? Uh, Slavoj Zizek, in one recent article, he pointed out how the problem today is that we have, in other words, the crisis we have, the emergencies we have today, is because we have too many specialists, too many technicians. We don't have enough people who see the problem from a global point of view. In other words, philosophically. So the fact that we still request, for example, at, in, here in, in Europe, we, we have so many technocrats, so many even governments, which are late, literally tech, technocratic governments, and we still have this idea, this idea that comes from modernity, and even before that from what we call metaphysics in philosophy, that we have to use in some way, we have to uh, let science take, do all the work, let technicians do all the work. And, uh, and by doing this, we create a, a serious problem because for example, economic problems, even Marx pointed this out, are not objective problems. They are not problems that you can solve through methods. Uh, they imply a number of factors that, uh, that it's impossible to reduce it to that. Now, having said this, as a philosopher, or I think in general, philosophy has to, uh, I think one big problem we have today is this problem, I think we are talking about this in part, is the idea of specifically what is the issue? Because we talked about a number of issues, a number of different emergencies, a number of different causes of emergencies. But what is the, the main issue, the main problem, okay? the one and only problem that we should, and I think as, as a, from a philosophical point of view, we should be talking about? In other words, I think we should be talking about, about in, in part I already mentioned the idea of absence of emergency. But absence of emergency also means absence of difference, right? absence of alterations. Uh, the, the point is that we have to try to overcome the scientific the, the idea that comes from modernity that we can, in some way, uh, create a revolution or a total, new, total different new and total different uh, framework. That's impossible. That, that's like believing in God. What we, do, what we can do okay, is create alterations. Okay? Alteration is something very different from an, um, an alternative. Alternatives, unfortunately, are not completely are not as uh, as possible, but alterations are, and so when I think that the main issue we should be looking at are specifically those emergencies we do not we do not confront. And by the way, I I, I talk we talk we're talking today about art, but I think there are many other uh, realms of uh, intellectual realms where that also discuss particular emergencies. There are a lot of scientists also that can try to work in some in some emergencies that we do not confront. So the issue for me is, well, what is specifically are we supposed to be dealing with? And I think that what we're supposed to be dealing with is specifically those absence of emergencies, those, those realms of thought in some way that we ignore. So I think Demos has already pointed out through those works of art, many of those, uh, many of those um, basically we could even call them uh, remnants or even um, discharge of society, right, that we ignore to a certain extent. The problem is that art can at least help us, okay, uh, allow them to emerge in some way, okay, the word emergency comes from emerge, to come out, right. Uh, the fact that, uh, and this is just to point out one, one, um, something about politics, because we, we should remember that 
this absence of emergency occurs also, in, for example, in politics. I mean, how many parties in Europe and in the United States as well, there is actually an opposition party? The opposition is almost, has almost dissolved. There is no more an opposition party. The left and the right almost are identical in the United States even more than here, but here too. So there's, a, there's a sort of an absence of conflicts there, okay, that in some way does not disclose the emergencies we have. Having said this, I think that it's great that if artists work together with scientists, and I think I'm not so sure that that, that should be our concern. Our concern should be to find those realms where the difference or the absence of emergency can, can emerge. So, now, the floor is yours, dear students and uh, fellows. Who wants to um, ask a question? You? Thank you. <laughs> Beautiful. Good. We still have David pending online, but first in person. Would you introduce yourself, please? Absolutely. Could I Thank you. Mask yeah, of yeah. course. <laughs> uh, hello, everybody. My name is Rai Sengupta, and I'm here visiting Barcelona from Oxford. Um, I'm actually originally from India. Uh, thank you for the lovely presentations, and it was a pleasure hearing all of you speak. My question is that uh, you know we talk about climate emergencies, we talk about um, planetary welfare, and these are complex concepts. And we're talking about the ability of art to convey these concepts. However, the issue that many people fe face is that people feel that these things will not happen in their lifetime, mm -hmm. or the fact that there is very little probability of these things actually happening. Even with the pandemic, we thought that we can put it off for the future. <laughs> so how can art help to communicate urgency of something that is very global, of something that is very broad-based and very distant for most of us here? Thank you. Well, <laughs> great question. This is the question, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, you are one. Uh, Shall I start with demos, maybe? Demo? Um, uh, should I call you Demos, TJ, Professor Demos? What do you prefer? TJ is great. TJ, great. <laughs> this is Isabel. <laughs> so, uh, would you. Uh, would you go and try to answer this very difficult and very interesting question? Sure. Um, thank you. For me, my my recent thinking about this, and it, it, it is indeed a, an urgent question to be asking, um, and it's a question that reflects upon the increasing um, um, seclusion of art within rather uh, you know, rarefied and privatized places of display and exhibition. So we're, we're seeing in some ways the, you know, while art in some cases can make major ambitious claims and conceptual analyses of present emergencies, at the same time, they're, you know, they're operating in, in these, these small islands of, uh, of discourse, of exhibition, of uh, engagement. I think that's one reason why we're seeing the kind of popular uh, social movement outbreaks of uh, declarations of climate emergency and um, protest movements on the streets by people like Extinction Rebellion and, and many others these days is because there's, there's a, a sense of a lack of a forum, of a people's forum, uh, where these issues of uh, urgency can be actually discussed. Um, so artists can do many things, and I don't want to. I don't want to limit it to a, a reductive, simple um, understanding of, of what needs to be, what needs to happen. I think we need lots of stuff. Uh, but one thing that I'm really interested in and focused on is uh, um, where art, the arts, um, increasingly is coming together and working in solidarity with social movements. Mm -hmm. Um, or NGOs or political organizations. And some of the examples that I showed, uh, for instance, forensic architecture mm -hmm. um, or the work of the Red Nation um, involve these, these, these very um, far-reaching and um, multi-aspect, uh, uh, these, these, these practices that have lots of different uh, aspects to them, including uh, a growing engagement with the fact that um, there's a profound dis dissatisfaction with simply presenting in 
um, the rarefied spaces of art, art galleries. And so we're seeing not only the use of uh, social media and new forms of technology, but also the, the growing recognition of the necessity of building solidarities with social movements and with uh, uh, some kind of social process dedicated to, uh, to organizations that um, is really arguably the only way that we have a chance of taking back the political process uh, so that we can enact the kinds of like structural alterations or uh, adjustments or however you wanna put it um, to you know, mitigate the ongoingness of uh, climate disaster. I think that's really crucial. I'm, I'm trying to, uh, to study and research that more, as well as um, uh, um, try to integrate that into my own practice, because this is also happening in academia. Uh, within academia, at least within some spheres, there's a lot of radical discourse, but it's happening in seminar rooms with just a few people. How, you know, how have we gotten into this situation of institutionalized specialization and enclosure? This is something I think we desperately and urgently need to break out of, uh, where academics too, I, I think are experiencing, at least some of us are, um, a growing imperative to not just exist within these islands of academia, but, but join in social movements uh, and try to do everything possible, whether it's uh, using uh, agitprop or propaganda, or uh, mo mobilizations or radical education, forms of uh, grassroots community collectivization, um, including international solidarities from the local to the global in trying to uh, mobilize for, uh, for ultimately for a, a transformation that's desperately needed to uh, save us from ongoing disaster. Uh, that you brought in academia, I was thinking really of that and the responsibility of what will, goes on in the uh, intramuros of universities, <laughs> which are really at the end, like cut from, uh, in fact, a, a Nile of, uh, of uh, uh, unre an unreal islands right uh and and in in a way this is why i was so adamant to make this session not in the university i mean that i think it was important unfortunately this is we are in this moment where we couldn't meet uh, here but the idea was to go through the galleries of the museum as you know very well the museum is in a very specific part of the city in barcelona where we have skaters uh, 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 you know just uh, in front and uh, in a very specific part of the city very colorful very conflictual as well and i wanted really to to uh, go out of this um, um, sedative, almost, ambience, at atmosphere of our university, which is so quiet, uh, normally, normally quiet, uh, not yesterday, but uh, normally, yes, and, uh, uh, and, and so. So it is, uh, it's very, very, I, I really thank you very much to, to bring in this, uh, this topic of the academia. But I'm sure that uh, as a representative of another of these, those modern institutions, such as a museum, um, Claudia may have a say, and then uh, uh, Santiago as well. And of course, any of you who shouldn't be so shy mm -hmm. and respectful, but um, just uh, contribute to the, to the uh, debate. So. Mm. Uh, Claudia. Yes, of course, the museum as well are, are institutions that have to rethink themselves. They have to open up to the neighborhood where they are. They have to open up to the work with activists. They have to open up. Somehow they have to make that people uh, appropriate the museum as if it, ha if it ha was a uh, derms. So in that sense, the museum should be like an open house to, to everybody, not in a, um, a simple way, but in, a, in, in, in the real way where uh, exchange of critical uh, mm, uh, information, exchange of critical knowledge, exchange of critical affect can be happening in 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 the museum space. And um, I really really enjoyed what uh, Tiji was saying. This idea of uh, um, 
how activism and art are, are emerging nowadays. And the museum obviously has the public programs, but also the exhibition them, themselves are spaces to open up. And uh, in the museum, we have many activities with the neighborhood and uh, with other communities that we approach and that we work with and that we collaborate for long periods of time and not in an extravistic way, but in the way of um, building something together. And this is uh, very important in, in the new idea of the museum that in Magba we, we embrace. So. Yes, I, I will add that probably a museum like this and some others are actually even more open than universities. In other words, um, uh, to a certain extent, uh, many of us academic, we have to be very careful even with our syllabus. There are certain, I, for example, have I have to fight in order to make sure that everybody gets to read one or two books, complete books in my courses, because now we are all be becoming specialists. So we all have to read just the introduction, just the, all this idea of departmentalization of knowledge, it's very clear also, for example, with big grants, the European ERC, the European Research Grants, they basically only fund uh, projects that, that are basically very, basically submitted to science. Uh, you would not find in the past 20 years of the ERC a project that has to, that dealt with data, for example, even John Paul Sartre. Okay, so this is a problem, a serious problem. Okay, a cultural problem in some way that can be overcome only by understanding that well, economics is not enough, uh, science is not enough. Uh, the question you asked before, which I think it was a very good question, is how can the artists? Well, I'm not so sure whether we should. I think it's a very good question, but the issue is not whether the art. You know, what is the artist? How is he going to, well, the question is more us. How are we going to be able to interpret this? The problem is the artist would do his own work, whatever, or she would do her own work, whatever it is. And if it works, if it has effects as a, as a work has, then wonderful. But it's more important to think, are we going to be able to understand that? Are we going to be able even to listen if it's a warning? Like I think so many works of art are warnings at the end. Are we going to be able to understand that, to listen to that? So what can help us? This is my, my concern is what can help us get closer to understanding and to listening what a work of art has to say? Well, among the many, many answers uh, that we can give is one of them is, for example, well, more museums probably or more events like this. In other words, more events that are more fluid and that have uh, that really take place only because there is an intervention here, both from us and from the public. In other words, just like the museum is supposed to be open, well, also the university is supposed to be much more open. Right? So here there is, in some way, I would even go as far as to say, well, there is, the problem is we're not having enough conversation, we're not having enough <laughs> dialogue, actually. And this is quite, it's quite strange to say this now that we have so much communication, right? We only have communication. We have so much communication that we're not communicating at all in some way. Uh, we have questions uh, online, right? Exactly. Our we have colleagues two on online. That I would like to address to basically all of our panelists. Um, so David had a really nice question uh, introduction. Like his question is funded on the idea that there are barriers uh, to break into the art world, and those more affected by those barriers are the voices that we need to hear the most. So he goes um, saying, when the most common mediums for artwork to be shared are to the masses are controlled by capitalists, how might most marginalized artists whose voices we need to hear disseminate their work so that the discourse can actually be changed? He's thinking particularly of the algorithmic control of the AI underpinning social media, but also the Hollywood board, etc. So how do we make the ones who are the most marginalized and the less supported by the capital be heard actually in the art world? So that's something I'm throwing to the three panelists. TJ, TJ uh, mm -hmm. you want to go first? Uh, sure, thank you, thank uh, you, David, for that question. Um, and I, I think I'll pick up on what Santiago was just saying in terms of um, it's, it's important what artists do, but it's also important how we all understand what artists are doing. Um, and there's a role, in other words, for um, critical discourse, for interpretation, for, um, for bringing, uh, for amplifying the work of artists through interpretive texts, through discussions, through uh, collective education, through teaching, through research and publications. 
through conferences like this. I think this is all really crucial. And it's incumbent on us, uh, for those of us who agree with the assumptions of that question, um, that um, the systems as they exist, which have increasingly become uh, technologized uh, in terms of a kind of algorithmic governance, um, tends to uh, perpetuate the biases of, ex of social exclusion that are dominant within the conditions of racial capitalism. Um, so I think, you know, one, we have to understand those dynamics and take a position of opposition in relation to them. And two, do what we can to um, not simply accept the, the, the presentations of mainstream, uh, non-critical types of institutions, but out, actually go out and, and try to, 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 to locate these, uh, these artists, not in a way that's extractive and an attempt to appropriate, uh, importantly, right, to do the work of the market uh, by introducing um, historically disenfranchised uh, practitioners so that they can be then uh, joined, you know, joined by um, economic investment and, uh, and representation, but rather to develop, again, ties of solidarity and political struggle in common so that we can change the system as it exists because it's just intolerable as it is. These exclusions, these um, these forms of discriminations that are embedded within the kind of coded biases of algorithms and recommendation engines are indeed deeply concerning. But we can't just, I think, uh, call for uh, removing biases because we have to look at the entire system uh, that has shaped those biases in the first place. And this is, you know, this might this might be uh, this might be. Uh, this might sound simple, but really, ultimately, this means engaging with and challenging the, the very conditions uh, of a centuries-long project of racial and colonial capitalism uh, that needs to be overturned. Um, so, you know, that is that's crucial. Um, we can't. I, so, I'm, I'm a little. I agree with. I think the the motivations of the question, but I just want to highlight that danger that we're living at a time of neoliberal diversity and uh, inclusivity that is increasingly trying to reach out to these, precisely these, these kind of marginalized artists in order to um, market them and publicize them and bring them into a kind of inevitably hierarchical and elite system of artistic representation. We wanna avoid, I think we wanna avoid that. We don't want the conditions of uh, uh, neoliberal artistic institutions to simply be more diversified. We want to challenge the entirety uh, of the structural conditions of that system to begin with. Thank you. Thank you. Totally agree as far as I'm concerned, uh, especially with these last sentences. Uh, <laughs> DJ, uh, Claudia, would you like to add hmm. something on that? Yes, I, I totally agree. And I think there's a danger, as you were saying, TJ, and uh, um, the idea would be to engage, I think, with long durational relationships, not only to picking these marginal artists and only working with them, but really um, set up a structure that is solidar solidarity structure where these artists that don't have the means can be actually engaged with the whole structure. Um, not only for a neoliberal uh, attitude to use them and then just throw them as um, uh, sometimes some uh, institutions do. Um, so in that sense, I think this is very important. And I believe that in uh, cur curators, theorists, um, artists, uh, people that were in the um, production of content, production of um, critical knowledge or intending, it's important to provide this platform for these exchanges, exchanges to be happening not so much um, um, to take these people and show them, but to provide a, a solidarity and uh, effective also and healthy environment for everybody to be able to gather in their own way with their own identities, with their own um, needs, challenges, and preoccupations. Um, yeah. Yes, um, I think if we if we look at um, um, 
the works of art that I that I choose or that I uh, that I like the ones I showed today and the ones that I that I expose in my book. Um, a lot of people have criticized me or at least pointed out or kindly pointed out that, <laughs> well, some of these artists are unknown. They, nobody actually knows them. Uh, and it's actually true. Uh, I mean, in the case today, I showed three quite important artists, but most of the artists that I, that I analyze in my book are not that important, actually, at least not yet, in, uh, and pr definitely not after my book, but they're, <laughs> they're not that important. In other words, they're not in the biggest museum, biggest galleries. And actually, I do not care about that because I think that what is important for us as an audience, like I was saying before, that we should be looking for those works of art that involve us. In other words, that's what most interests me. In other words, the, the artist in some way is almost, I will even say this, uh, it's almost irrelevant. I mean, it, what's important is the work of art. It's the work of art that has to involve us into uh, a discourse that is probably missing right now. In other, words, in other words, into a communication that is missing right now. I think the work of the creators, it, it's vital now, okay? So it's vital, but it's also vital, I think, the, the, um, uh, also from, a, from, from government, it's also very important that they understand the space that has to be given to the humanities in general, not only art, because I think that at the end we are here also talking about the humanities in general, because the humanities in general bring about, can bring about a much more profound changed than the one which we're, we're accustomed to believe. Um, having said this, uh, I think it's also important to, to recognize uh, the value of, of the space. In other words, the space the museum um, uh, gives. In other words, there's a question, is there enough space for artists and for art in general to, to, to show its work? Well, we probably need more space, more public space for art. That's also a place where one can encounter. I mean, that's, I have a, a slight preference for works of art that involve interventions with the public. Uh, there's Nele Azevedo, this Brazilian artist that creates small sculptures of men in ice, and she, you know, everybody has to help her put all the small sculptures in, in several squares in Europe. And so there's an intervention there that you bring along all the people to work there together with you. So this is what we're supposed to be, I think, as an audience today, we're supposed to be looking for those those works of art that involve us, but involve us at what level? Well, not at a political level, not even at an aesthetical level, but much more at an existential level. Why? Because the issues that touch us now are mad regard our existence, have to do with our existence, whether we will exist. So if there will be future, it also depends on how much all this opening that the art allows us to see. Okay? So it's a question of lack of imagination. You know? So we need more imagination now than what we used to probably. Why? Well, because of how framed we are through artificial intelligence and so forth. Mm -hmm. I think there was a question there yep. in the public. Thank you. Hi. Uh, <coughs> I'm Ada Mergen. I'm an art historian from uh, New York University. Um, I just wanted to get back to something that, uh, that Claudia was saying about sustainability. And I think what you mean uh, by sustainability here is in, a, in essentially a, in terms of system and circulation mm -hmm. of works rather than actual materials, exactly. right? And uh, you know, this opens in some ways onto something that TJ was saying before about um, the, the unfortunate kind of provinciality or, or closed nature of our discourses. I mean, some, something like, you know, six major galleries in New York now oh, essentially okay. dominate um, the art world, whether we sort of choose to recognize it or not. And, uh, you know, it made me think in terms of what you were saying about um, kind of sustainability, the uh, sustainability of aesthetic practice. You know, what about thinking of it in terms of something like a global WPA, a Global Works Pro Pro uh, Progress Administration that the, you know, that the United States under Roosevelt launched in the wake of the Depression, which was itself, of course, mm -hmm. its own kind of emergency. I mean, that's a very sort of quixotic thought, but it's it, perhaps an interesting one to consider. And that opens on to, uh, I guess, my second point or question, which is a hegemony of a different sort and a more philosophical and, and kind of ontological question about aesthetics, which was raised, I think, in the Esteban um, mm -hmm. film, which is indeed extraordinary and chilling um, and one of the most uncomfortable things I've seen in a very long <laughs> yes. time. Um, and it made me think too about um, imminence, imminence to um, the discourse of 
of technology and surveillance and artificial intelligence. I mean, the very fact that Esteban has made this film with technology mm -hmm. um, you know, made me think too about uh, someone earlier in the 20th century who, whose works we can think of in, in, to some extent in comparison, um, Pier Paolo Pasolini, who launched mm -hmm. a, in, in some ways a, a kind of poetics of, of ecology and the environment before it had been, you know, identified as such. Um, himself, you know, de determinedly, decidedly anti-technological, such as it was in the 60s and 70s, um, but someone who, who, of course, used technology to give voice to that poetics of opposition. Um, and some of the things that, that TJ showed from forensic architecture to, you know, I thought also we didn't, his name wasn't raised, but someone like Trevor Paglin, um, you know, can we, is it, is it possible to get outside of the language of technology and AI and surveillance? It's probably not, right? And that's why the, 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 the language of appropriation is the only way that we can use to create, to, to, to critique these discourses, right? From within them, from within technology, which, you know, the neo-avant-garde in the, in, uh, in the 1960s also, uh, you know, whether it was pop or whether it was, um, you know, early examples of postmodern kind of appropriation, this notion that we could use these tools of technocratic um, oppression in order to critique them from within. That is obviously, you know, capitalism never re it recognized that game and of course assimilated it to its very fabric. But I guess my sort of larger question, uh, and it's obviously one that can't be answered here, but perhaps we could think about is, um, does it matter the medium through which these discourses are made? Does it matter how they are um, encountered by a general public? Um, I mean, I, I love sort of the, the, my favorite things about this discussion have been the very, the most in some ways basic and practical ones like Santiago's and Isabella and TJ's about sort of where do people see these things? How do they enter the museum? What are the mm -hmm. forums in which, with which they're encountering them? Um, how can people be, you know, reminded of these things in ways that are not necessarily dogmatic, but, um, you know, anti-positivist in, in a way that I think Santiago's mm -hmm. talk kind of raised. So those are just some of my general questions, observations. Yeah, please, of course. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, the first thing that comes to mind is uh, the movie Don't Look Up on Netflix. Uh, <laughs> it's a very good example because yes. although it's That's part of Netflix, really it's probably, probably the <laughs> movie has probably done in part with an algorithm, I don't know, but at least it didn't, it didn't get it right because the movie clearly points out everything I was trying to say. You know, it's clearly that <laughs> something is coming down and we don't believe in it and we just don't listen to the warnings. So that's an example of... Now, uh, the idea that emancipation can take place uh, within our, uh, what we call metaphysic or within our global frame uh, technological world is something that before Pasolini, uh, Heidegger saw. Heidegger himself, he pointed out that in a complete world of total technologization in which we will live, and we are living in that, uh, not only, of course, uh, we will find ourselves not thinking anymore, which we almost, are. today we are thinking, <laughs> but normally we don't think. Um, but most of all, he, Heidegger points out that it is precisely there that something can go wrong. In other words, it is precisely in the total organization when something can go wrong, which is not necessarily bad, but it can go wrong, okay? For example, I think that this movie, Don't Look Up, something went wrong in Netflix. They shouldn't have done that because <laughs> it, this is why. So one of my answers to you, to in part to, to your question would be, well, yes, maybe in the medium it's not that important, but perhaps irony can be important here. Yeah. Okay, so and this is something that uh, Pasolini, of course, worked with a lot and, uh, and many others. So I think it is the possibility that within the total, uh, the total frame, the total situation of the absence of emergency, something will emerge. Well, this is why, again, what is important is whether we are prepared to listen, whether we are prepared to respond in some way. Yeah. Thank you so much for your comments. Very interesting. Um, really, we could, we could be talking about them for, for, for days. <laughs> you open up so many questions. Um, I think, for example, related with the, with the film A Forest, um, I'm not sure about the medium. I think it, 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 it doesn't matter, actually. The medium, it, it depends the, the aim of the project. M maybe one medium is 
is that a credit for one because it means there's a political intention to use that or the other so I, I think we should go uh, case by case but in the in the in the example of a forest the film it's true that I think the artist by using a dominant language and showing it to us he's actually disarticulating and somehow reconfiguring a category that wants to be dominant by showing Exactly. The, the timber of the artificially generated voice, uh, mm -hmm. you, know, the, uh, you know, everything about it is irony. I guess my point is, is that the, the ironic teeth of a, mm -hmm. of a kind of appropriationist tendencies since the 60s have been yeah. revealed to be, unfortunately, largely toothless by capitalism, right? That irony, mm -hmm. uh, in fact, Pasolini was... <laughs> He was so earnest as to never really even believe that irony could make a difference in in discourse, right? Uh, the the neo avant garde absolutely believed in it. I guess I, I feel like we're at such a, a pessimistic point now, such that <laughs> irony becomes a consolation of sorts, but does it well, change anything, right? I mean, that's not to say that that film doesn't. Sh no, no, I, I don't understand. want to quantify changes in consciousness or anything. I mean, it was very powerful and. And incredibly generative of, um, but I, I I agree with you completely that it it it, it is obviously using the, the the language of I mean even the self satisfied kind of chuckles right mm -hmm. which he gives lets us know that it's made from within the discourse of of big tech and venture capital and such like that and you know uh, but anyway I interrupted you no so. no no but I agree what you're saying it's true that this irony has to be um, uh, active it can't be passive irony can um, uh, cancel the the activation it should have um, an effect actually in that sense the uh, TJ would you like to add something to these uh, comments by our friend here yeah thank you for that question and and the responses by my uh, co-panelists um I'm think I am also interested in Don't Look Up. I think that that was a, a really interesting film. Um but I don't think it was about showing how um like we with with uh, you know like a, a generalized um undifferentiated we are ignoring climate disaster. I think it showed clear what I, what, I, what I was interested in how it showed that uh, media, political, and economic elites are either invested in denying the disaster or instrumentalizing it and turning it into an economic opportunity. Exactly. Whereas uh, engaged scientists and people on the street were aware, they are aware of what's going on and they're trying to resist, mm -hmm. but they run up against problems. This is, it was a movie about ultimately uh, all sorts of uh, conflicts, including class conflicts. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that's that's crucial. We have we I think we should avoid the um, perpetuation of an undifferentiated, generalized uh, we. Mm -hmm. um, and, and and then in terms of the question, I <clears throat> I didn't mean to suggest that we should avoid technology or algorithms or AI. I think you know the point is, um, as people like um, Dan McQuillan and lots of other people say, we have to figure out ways to create a non-fascist AI. We have to figure out ways to put technology for the, you know, to the use of uh, progressive, emancipatory, uh, radical struggle. And there are people who are doing this. Jonas Stahl, who's a Dutch artist, I think is really interesting with his project uh, dedicated to collectivizing Facebook. Let's collectivize Facebook and take it away from ownership by billionaires. Or uh, what Joy Bulamwini is doing at MIT in terms of the Algorithmic Justice, Justice League. The, um, the AJL, the Ag Alg Algorithmic Justice, Justice League, which I think is really a, a fascinating project. There's others as well. Um, mm -hmm. And similarly with museums, we have to be really careful. I, I think it's an, it's an important point to, to point out this consolidation of uh, galleries um, and, and markets within New York and lots of other places. I think this is really crucial. Um, museums too are thoroughly imminent to the conditions of capital, and I, like if if people know about a project that's going on in New York called Strike MoMA, I think it's really interesting mm -hmm. how artists and activists are challenging the Museum of Modern Art in New York for uh, the Board of Trustees ties to, to the weapons industry, to private uh, prisons, 
to the carceral state, to pharmaceutical industries, to communications uh, conglomerate, conglomerates. I, this is a really interesting challenge to the, again, the, the neoliberalization of the museum as a site of, uh, of, of capitalist ruling class interests. And, you know, these, these, these politics are, are becoming more and more crucial. I think it's not, you know, the we of, the, of generalized people, um, first of all, I don't think it exists. And if anything, it's a site of tremendous uh, political, economic, racial, gender-based, uh, and technological conflict these days. I think that's really the kind of uh, contradiction and, and tension that we need to focus on. Thank you. I think we will take one more question from the uh, from the web, right, from the chat, and uh, we will close the yes. session. Is that okay, Lila? Perfect. So we have Mario commenting that science and arts tend to be of doom and gloom, right? So that urgency can be suppressive, create anxiety rather than empower at the end of the day. So how can we empower more? like that, use that state of panic for something positive, right? How can we listen to the needs of those who need to act and trying to incentivize while, while showing the urgency? So not getting a negative response and the frozen one, there's nothing we can do, but rather an empowering one where you say, okay, there is an issue, but there's also a solution, right? So I guess that's the question for all the panelists, nobody in specific. Would you begin? I will try, I will try. Um. Um, uh, <laughs> Or if there is a problem, uh, then the answer is already there also. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to even ask, find the problem. Uh, it's impossible. We, have, we all have what we call prejudice, right? We all have certain uh, ideas. Th there's some reason why we, we can actually imagine a certain mathematical problem, because we already find, have the result in some way. In other words, we already know we have some familiarity with problems when they emerge, right? Otherwise, we wouldn't recognize them at all. So. How do we how do we move beyond this? How do we how do we understand which problems we're supposed to uh, tackle first? For, for example, I think the question perhaps is going in that direction if I interpret it properly. I think it has a lot to do with the issue of uh, which are the questions that concern us the most. Right? By, and by concerning, I think that now we have we face a number of global emergencies, okay, which literally affect everybody. Right? Uh, not simply the pandemic, but also the more even, even more so uh, the rise in sea levels that literally affect everyone in the planet. So those are the problems that we're supposed to be confronting us as, as, you know, in whatever way it is. Because the, also the, another problem I think we have today is this, uh, this idea that we can confront certain problems only through science or only through certain methods. There are a number of different ways we can. Activism does not only mean one thing. One can be an activist even as a philosopher. I write in newspapers and often, of course, get into trouble. But it's, that's part of the deal, right? There isn't only one answer on how one can tackle the problems we have. Uh, and this is something that I think the art world in general, and in particular this art world here that we are part of today, is one that takes these this, this issues into, into consideration, okay? Uh, I think here the, the whole issue of education is very important. Uh, education here is the key, I think, to whether we are going to be able to listen in the future to emergencies and to, in general, to those problems we cannot, we do not, we're not allowed or we're not, we're not invited to take into consideration. Education here is key, and by education I mean in particular the, the humanities, of course. <laughs> Good. <laughs> As far as we both are concerned. <laughs> uh, TJ, one final uh, remark uh, on this uh, qu final question to our session. Yeah. Thanks. Sure, thank you. And, and just to say uh, it's a real pleasure to uh, engage in this uh, really, um, I think, fascinating and engaging discussion. I, I really uh, enjoyed it. So uh, thank you all uh, to the panelists and also the uh, the audience posing these really interesting questions. Just, just quickly to say, um, uh, you know, technology is a function of material social conditions, um, and that includes the economy. Um, and it's not surprising that uh, within the art world, for instance, we're seeing uh, symptomatically uh, the emergence of things like NFTs um, and digital immersive environments dedicated to uh, 
uh, like Van Gogh exhibitions on a popular level. Um, this is where technology is simply and directly um, functioning in the way that it is designed to and shaped within the conditions of uh, the dominant uh, economy. Um, so the, the challenge is to um, change the material, social, and economic conditions that allow technology to emerge in this way. Can, we can also uh, possibly use technology itself as a critical tool, a critical instrument. And I've me I mentioned some examples of how that might be done, whether it's, I think forensic architecture is an amazing example of attempting to develop um, the conditions of non-fascist AI, a, a critical anti-colonial use of algorithms, um, for instance, one that also challenges the, um, the, do the dominant um, uh, location of art institutions within uh, the capitalist economy. Uh, there are ways of doing this, but we can't simply invent uh, an emancipatory technology within a larger oppressive social and economic um, uh, framework. So, um, you know, the, the, it, this is immensely, immensely challenging, complicated and ambitious, but I think that this is the, the goal of any kind of emancipatory horizon, not just to invent um, a liberatory technology, but to change real social, material, economic conditions um, that uh, play a role in shaping technologies. Uh, within the realm of cli climate science, we're seeing the technocratic solution is geoengineering. Again, a kind of techno-determinist approach to saving ourselves from climate emergency that's narrowly defined as a, an emergency of uh, carbon in the atmosphere. I think this is, again, um, a form of uh, neoliberalism, uh, neoliberal um, economic opportunism uh, that is deeply socially and politically unjust. And that has to also be a, uh, has, has to have a place in our climate politics. So, um, yeah, that, this is, I, I acknowledge that this is incredibly broad and ambitious and difficult and mm -hmm. challenging, but I think that's the struggle before us. So, uh, this is the end, <laughs> my friends. This is the end, my friends. <laughs> it's not that apocalyptic. <laughs> 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 Thank you so much, so much um, to all of you. Uh, TJ, it was a, a real pleasure to have you here and to meet you. I guess mm. I hope the next time oh, we person, will meet yeah. in person. I'm sure that there will be more opportunities to go on talking and discussing and debating about these issues. Um, uh, Claudia, thank you so much. And oh, thank, thank you, you so much to the museum and all those working at the museum who have be, who have made this session possible, Yolanda, the technicians, everyone. Leila, thank you so much for You're your welcome. job <laughs> during all those days. You You're still have welcome. one more session mm. tomorrow mm -hmm. and that will be the end. The end. <laughs> and, uh, and Santiago, you and I go on, right? Yes. And uh, preparing the next event <laughs> on... Uh, the next end, yes, <laughs> the next end. Thank you uh, to you all for being here, to att for attending. And um, in a better world, we will be having a drink right now. <laughs> but this is not a better world, so we just... Imagine. Wait for the next time. Wait for the next time, for that's it. <laughs> Thank you Thank so you. much.